Recently, climate change critic Tony Heller released a new video which he promises will be the first of a series on why climate science is broken. I enjoyed so much the thoughtful debate of our last exchange and the friendliness and open-mindedness of Tony's supporters, I thought this would be worth a look. And it's actually pretty interesting. It raises a couple of matters where Tony and I are in complete agreement. Try not to faint, although there are plenty of things for us to disagree about as well. But he raises an important issue. I thought it would be interesting to explore, so let's jump in. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. We're going to have to wade through some of this stuff before we get to the good stuff. Climate science is driven by politics. The central body around climate science is called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's part of the United Nations. The title contains the word government, and it also contains the words climate change. The purpose of this governmental body is not to study climate, but rather it's to develop the basis of justifying global climate action. Yes, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has the word government in it. It also has the word in and over and mental in it. Just because it has the word government in it doesn't make it a governmental body. Intergovernmental, of course, means it's set up by numerous governments, which it is by definition if it's set up by the United Nations. It has no governing role, only an advisory one. And Tony seems to be under a misapprehension here. He says it's the principal body for the advancement of climate science, and hence he thinks it's surprising that its remit is not to study climate. But of course, it isn't the principal body of the scientists. They are generally attached to universities and similar bodies. It was set up in 1988 with a remit to provide the world with a clear scientific view on the current state of knowledge in climate change and the potential environmental and socio-economic impacts. It doesn't do any research of its own or monitor climate. It reviews and assesses the most recent information from the peer-reviewed literature. The scientists who contribute to its reports, which summarise that literature, do so for free, which is something to bear in mind when people go on about follow the money, as they sometimes do. The UN announced the contents of their 2014 report four years earlier in the year 2010. What the scientists found doing their research over the next four years was irrelevant to the conclusions of the report. The IPCC results are predetermined, and the scientists are just there to provide cover for the politicians. Well, that's pushing it a bit. The fact that well in advance of the report date, it was obvious from what they were seeing from the research that had already been published, that a number of assumptions were being revised in the wrong direction, doesn't provide the evidence that you're claiming there. 9,200 peer-reviewed studies went into the 2014 report. Well, quite a few of those were already published by 2010. There have been some pretty solid trends in this data and no sudden reversals in fortune. So it shouldn't be surprising, but it was obvious already in 2010 which way things were going. This is, remember, a huge operation with a lot of research to compile. It's not as though the authors sit around to the very last minute waiting for a boffin in a white coat to come running in with the latest data in his or her hand just in time for them to get it off to the printers. The modern global warming hysteria began with NASA's James Hansen testifying before a Congress on a very hot day in June 1988. This was the front page of the New York Times on June 24th, 1988. Global warming has begun, expert tells Senate. Tony then goes on to tell the story about how Senator Tim Wirth and Jim Hansen conspired to get the Climate Change Congress hearing on the hottest day of the year and sabotage the air conditioning to make it nice and toasty for the assembled politicians listening to Hansen's message. And here's my first point of agreement with Tony in this video. That is just stupid grandstanding behaviour and frankly unworthy of the seriousness of the operation. No argument from me. You can't do that sort of thing and then complain when a Republican senator brandishes a snowball in the Senate and suggests that because it's cold weather, then global warming must be nonsense. Either we understand the difference between weather and climate or we don't. This is why I keep banging on in these videos about bad process or bad arguments aren't justified by worthy intentions. You always set a precedent that will come back to bite you. So we're agreed on that one, Tony. I'm not convinced that Jake was single-handedly responsible for Hansen's evidence being influential, but it was definitely dumb behaviour. 
Let's carry on. James Hansen told Congress that he was 99% certain that summers were going to get much hotter and droughts were going to become much more frequent. He said that the chances of summer drought in the low and middle latitudes would be 1 in 3 by the year 2030 as against 1 in 20 in the 1950s. So let's see how Hansen's forecast did. Okay, I'm not entirely sure why we're diving into an attack on Hansen's predictive powers at this stage. The 1988 climate models were relatively limited since it was a new field. Here's a diagram showing how the different elements of a complex picture have gradually been added to the model since those early days. The current models have much improved predictive accuracy because they allow for the multiple factors that make a difference. We were talking about the relationship between politics and science a moment ago, and now we're on to attacking the science. We can dive in and do this, but it just seems a distraction from the original point. Well, if we're going to assess Hansen's performance, we should look at what he actually said, because it was a little more nuanced than the sound bites that made it into the newspapers that Tony's quoting there, Although it's worth noting that even in those clips, Hansen says that the effects will be regional. This is verbatim from his testimony to Congress. However, the point that I would like to make is that in the late 1980s and in the 1990s, we notice a clear tendency in our model for greater than average warming in the southeast United States and the Midwest. In our model, this result seems to arise because the Atlantic Ocean of the coast of the United States warms more slowly than the land. This leads to high pressure along the east coast and circulation of warm air north into the midwest or southeast. There is only a tendency for this phenomenon, it's certainly not going to happen every year, and climate models are certainly an imperfect tool at this time. However, we conclude that there is evidence that the greenhouse effect increases the likelihood of heat wave drought situations in the southeast and midwest United States, even though we cannot blame a specific drought on the greenhouse effect. I think it's worth noting how tentative and honest that is. It's not overclaiming for the sophistication of the models in 1988, quite the reverse. And it's very cautious about how increased heat wave drought situations are being seen, and very regionally specific about where they're being seen. This graph is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and shows precipitation for the United States going back to the year 1895. You can see that it's been steadily increasing. Why are we looking at a graph showing rainfall when we're talking about heat waves? Current predictions are that we'll see more hotter weather plus more rainfall. So this simply backs up the latter predictions. And why are we looking at a US-wide graph when Hansen's comments related to geographically specific parts of the US? Some areas we expect to get hotter, some will get wetter, some will do both. Bury all of that into a national average if you want, but it's not related to what James Hansen specifically predicted. Now let's look at heat waves. This graph shows the summer percent of days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 Celsius, at all Northeast US historical climatology network stations. Tony then shows a graph of the Northeast temperatures. We won't dissect that graph because, as we've seen, Hansen was talking specifically about Southeast and Midwest, not Northeast. And then we have this graph, which seems to be a killer support for Tony's argument. And if we look at the entire country, the trend of decreasing hot days is sharply downwards over the past century. Hansen had no idea what he was talking about. But wait a moment. The graph Tony shows at this point has no source given. If we go to the official statistics, we find this graph, which is the share of US land with unusually high summer temperatures. As we can see, there's a spike in the 1930s which corresponds with a dust bowl. Did I mention that the heat of a dust bowl was exacerbated by poor farming practices? I know Tony's fans always enjoy it when I mention that. Once again, I provide a link to the peer-reviewed science on that subject in the video description. I only say it because the scientists say it. But then we have a clear increase since 1988 and of a measure that makes sense given Hansen's specific comment that it was regionally specific. We're not getting caught in averages here. We're seeing that more land is seeing more hot extremes. I did a little further looking and found a blog post on Tony's site where he dismisses this graph as wildly fraudulent and then he presents this one as his alternative. So it's Tony Heller's own graph that he's putting forward as the proof that Jim Hansen, quote, didn't know what he was talking about. Well, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to explain how your graph was arrived at, 
why it's more accurate, and if we're being sciencey about it, we'd be publishing that somewhere where it can be peer reviewed, just to make sure that this is not some massive misunderstanding of the data. But Tony doesn't do any of that. So really, I think generally you'd have to stick with the NOAA data. When it comes to overall global temperatures, Hansen presented three scenarios that came from his climate model, simple as it was, with the variables for each clearly explained. After the event, the greenhouse gas emissions that were the variable between the three projections came in closest to option B. The actual observed temperature changes showed actual warming was less than option B. The prediction slightly out, scientists now know, because he factored in a higher climate sensitivity than the one we now know to give the best fit. He used a climate sensitivity of 3.4 degrees centigrade, whereas now scientists agree that it should be 3 degrees centigrade. Had his model used today's agreed sensitivity, it would have been very close indeed. Which is not bad, given how much the sophistication of the models has moved on since 1988. So rather than Hansen not knowing what he was talking about because his prediction didn't match Tony's special graph, it seems he was pretty okay, even if he was prone to colluding with some stupid grandstanding with the air conditioning. So that's our diversion into the science. Now Tony gets back to arguably the main thrust of his argument. Al Gore was elected vice president in 1992, shortly after the coolest summer on record in the United States. The climate wasn't cooperating with global warming theory, so Al Gore took matters into his own hands. Vice President Al Gore immediately started purging the nation's top scientists when he took office in January 1993. One of Gore's first targets was Dr. Bill Gray at Colorado State University. Dr. Gray was the top tropical meteorologist in the world and the man who invented hurricane forecasting. Gore invited Dr. Gray to a global warming conference he was holding in Washington. Dr. Gray said he'd be happy to attend, but Gore needed to know that he was not a big believer in Gore's theories. Gore responded by cutting off Dr. Gray's funding. Dr. Gray had received funding every year from NOAA for about 30 years prior to that, but he never got another penny out of the government as long as he lived. Now, I'm not sure about this one. The narrative seems much more that peer review prevented his proposals on climate change being accepted for funding because they weren't good enough quality. But his work on hurricanes was still encouraged. And since Bill Gray in 2006 said it may warm another three, five, eight years and then it will start to cool, and that was definitely a failed prediction, it may well be just correct that this was a quality check. Oh, and he also said Gore believed in global warming almost as much as Hitler believed there was something wrong with the Jews. You know, it might not be worthy of a conspiracy theory if you go comparing the sitting vice president to Hitler and then you find you're not invited to parties anymore. I mean, there's conspiracy theories and there's just self-destructive behaviour. If I'd compared the CEO of my previous job to Hitler, probably wouldn't have played out well for me. And I recommend you don't try it yourself either. Sometimes how people behave is a factor. And in addition to that, Gray was also criticised for how he attacked some fellow scientists in uncompromising ways. Now, I didn't know him. I don't know all the background. So let's assume Tony's right in spite of all of that, because for his next example, he's on much less ambiguous ground. Another victim of the Gore Purge was Dr. William Happer from Princeton. Dr. Happer is one of the most respected radiative transfer experts in the world, and he was head of energy research at the Department of Energy. But because of his disagreement with Al Gore about global warming theory, he was quickly relieved of his job. The description of what happened with William Happer seems basically in line with how it's been recorded and written up. For instance, here's this contemporary story. These are turbulent times in Washington for science. Consider the case of William Happer, who was dismissed from his post as Director of Energy Research of the Department of Energy, after opposing the prevailing views of Vice President Al Gore and his environmental aides on the harmful effects of ozone depletion and greenhouse gases on the Earth's environment and on human health. Happer's dispute with Gore's people is the first instance of a Clinton administration enforcing its vision of political correctness on scientists in its midst. The sacking of Happer, a former Princeton University physics professor with impressive credentials, raises questions about whether the administration will be able to recruit scientists for sensitive positions when science conflicts with politics. And that question right there 
goes to the heart of the debate for me. How much do we think a political administration should be appointing scientific advisers on the basis of the agreement between their beliefs and the political worldview of the administration? Shouldn't it be about getting excellent scientific minds, getting them to operate in a collegiate, peer-reviewed, evidence-based environment and letting them sort it out? Because the danger is that you end up with crappy advice from people who, rightly or wrongly, conclude that the way to progress is to tell you what they think you want to hear. And that's never a good idea. The best chief executives of companies know the last thing they should ever do is surround themselves with yes-men. And if that holds true for a company, surely it's a good principle for government. And some of you, not Tony's fans I know, but some of you might be thinking, oh no, Al Gore was absolutely right, because frankly any scientist who doesn't believe in climate change is obviously not up to the job. That may have been the case with John Gray on climate science specifically. He was clearly massively respected for his work on hurricanes. But by all accounts, that's simply not the case in the instance of William Happer. Maybe there's more to it than is in the public record, but it prompts us to focus on the principle nonetheless. Because once you establish a principle, it gets used against you in the end. Again, You can't complain about the Trump administration taking actions to get the science in line with its political worldview if you already established when it suited you that that's a reasonable way for an administration to behave. Now, admittedly, he's become a rather starkly higher profile, like President Trump instructing Noah to confirm his completely wrong assertion about the trajectory of a hurricane. I mean, even Trump supporting conservatives thought that was a bit weird. But there are lots of other examples where climate scientists have been pushed aside in various positions. Although, to be fair, Trump surprised scientists generally when he, after a long pause, appointed the current White House science advisor, Kelvin Drudgemeyer, probably mangled his name, apologies to him, an expert in extreme weather, highly regarded by the community. So let's not believe in total caricatures on either side of the debate. Anyway, you could see grounds where Tony and I might agree on some of this, Unfortunately, in Tony's mind, as expressed in his video, this isn't a question of a relationship between political leaders and independent scientific advisers. He believes it's all about the alarmist conspiracy, that it's purely a one-way flow and it's about spreading bad science. Which is a strange position, because with President Trump in the White House, you can't really say that the deep state is controlling the agenda in the way that you might have when it was Clinton and Gore. You see Trump influencing the agenda in the way he wants. It's just that in that case, it's the way that Tony would want as well. But this is my message to both sides. Bad process should never be justified on the basis that it gives you the outcome you wanted. Because sooner or later, it'll be used against you. I suppose I'm influenced by being a Brit where it's accepted that we have a professional civil service which is non-party political and aims to professionally serve whichever party is in government. Now, I absolutely understand the alternative approach where an administration chooses its own executive team to be fully in line with its objectives. But when it comes to independent scientific advice, where science is so much about building up of knowledge over time on a broad base of peer-reviewed evidence, there's got to be a strong argument in there somewhere for preserving the independence of the advisers from the political whims of the party in charge. I don't know. I'd be genuinely interested to know what you think on this. Tony then goes to cover the events I covered in my own last video, the attack on Michael Mann by the supporters of Naomi Klein. Climate activists no longer need alarmist scientists like Michael Mann, and they're starting to purge them too. Climate activist Natalie Molina Nino threw Michael Mann under the bus yesterday. She said, Dear Nature, we're done reading the mansplaining trash from myopic white bros who do not speak for those on the front lines. Michael Mann has been and continues to be problematic and dated. Publishing his mediocrity isn't a good look. This sort of vicious attack on a scientist based on his race and gender appears to be acceptable among climate activists at this point. And then Natalie continued her vicious attack against Michael Mann later. Climate activists no longer need scientists on either side of the debate. Climate alarmists like Michael Mann played a dangerous game allowing politicians to call the shots, and now the politicians no longer need them. Climate alarmism no longer has anything to do with science. 
I don't think it's that at all. I think it's that the radical left is destroying itself with its obsession with identity politics and call-out culture. Even Obama called for that particular nonsense to stop because of how incredibly self-defeating it is. Large numbers of people, scientists and activists, leapt to Michael Mann's defence against the charge of mansplaining because he dared to criticise Naomi Klein's support for the everything including the kitchen sink Green New Deal. You see, if you were right that the scientists were at the beck and call of politicians who want to introduce socialism via the mechanism of climate policy, then that spat wouldn't have happened. But man, whatever your opinion of him, is pointing out the damage to the scientific imperative of climate change by tying it together to a bunch of extreme left craziness. Those are kind of my words, of course. He was actually obsequiously respectful to Naomi Klein. Much good it did him. I'm imagining that the supporters of Tony would agree with that in principle. So there you are. You do agree with Michael Mann after all. You might as well enjoy the irony. We can all laugh about such things over a beer when the rhetoric's been exhausted. So Tony, I was prompted to make this video because you raise interesting points. But I think you're missing the really trenchant critique you could develop because you're fixated on the narrative of the global climate conspiracy. One peer-reviewed paper investigated what it would require for a global conspiracy on climate change to be real. And they identified that over 400,000 people would have to be in on the conspiracy for it to work. If you step back from your dissatisfaction with the way you think some of the statistics are being handled, that's a pretty huge leap to believe such a vast group with so little in a way a powerful incentive would actually hold together as a conspiracy. Surely in the way of Bayesian reasoning we could find a simpler explanation that fits the facts. It's just a thought.